This past week has seen the introduction of a new buzzword into the coverage of American politics, normalization. It describes the attempt by some voices in the U.S. media to soften criticism of Donald Trump following his election victory. Normalization comes in many shades and occurs for various reasons, foremost among them, access. Whether it's a front row seat in the White House briefing room or being on the right email list when a story is leaked, news outlets need access to be in the know. If that means conducting a softball interview or two, writing a favorable piece here and there, setting aside some unsavory comments about women, Muslims and Mexicans, that's a price that many a journalist is willing to pay. Given Donald Trump's troublesome relationship with the mainstream media, he spent the last part of his campaign demonizing them. Many reporters within the D.C. Beltway are already wondering if they'll ever get the kind of access to the Trump White House that they've had under previous administrations. One of the president-elect's first hires was a far-right media operative, Steve Bannon, and he's no mere press secretary. He's Trump's new chief strategist. Bannon made his name running Breitbart News, a far-right news site which is popular with the kind of voters that the U.S. mainstream media have been accused of overlooking. This appointment says a lot about how Trump's administration will deal with the mainstream media and where this story is going. Our starting point this week is Washington, D.C. I find the press to be extremely dishonest. By the way, I hate some of these people. A big part of the rigging are these dishonest people in the media. Donald Trump spent a lot of campaign time attacking the mainstream news media. Don't ask me questions like that. You're not a very good reporter doing that. And the U.S. media don't get any more mainstream than 60 Minutes. And Mr. Trump's first television interview was... A CBS institution for almost half a century. And his first post-election interview was different in look, tone, and content. In short, it was all quite normal. The 60 Minutes interview, I think, was, was fascinating as a, as a media moment in the way in which uh, everything was framed. He looked more statesman-like. The tone of the interview was very interesting. The interviewer, Leslie Stahl, fell somewhere between deferring to the president-elect. I don't want to be just a little, nice, monotone, character and in many cases be? I will be sure I can. <laughs> and being obsequious there was a little bit of prodding about the protest here in every city but for instance there was no talk of the tape in which he talked about uh, groping women essentially sexual assault I saw parts of that 60 minutes interview um, I did not watch the whole thing because it reminded me too much of what I've seen in other countries where a leader is normalized. I think the press tries to make you into something a little bit different. In my case, a little bit of a wild man. I'm not. I'm actually not. I'm a very sober person. I studied authoritarian regimes for most of my career. And what you are seeing right now is the normalization of an authoritarian leader. You're seeing a compliant media, you're seeing a complicit media, and you're seeing a media that seems very afraid. And I think that's the reason why they picked 60 Minutes, knowing that Mr. Trump would not be challenged very forcefully, where he could appear presidential, where he'd be portrayed with respect uh, to try to have the audience uh, buy into that type of setting as well. Whether it takes place on the air, in a newspaper, or in a celebrity magazine, normalization is a trend that has not escaped the attention of other voices in the U.S. media. Opinions on the matter in major newspapers range from the determined to the conflicted. Settle down, guys. Amongst the considerations at play for news organizations positioning themselves for the new administration is the age-old question of access, the fear of being frozen out by the Trump White House and starved of news content. Some of what you're seeing is, is uh, a traditional respect for the office of the presidency, but you know what I would urge other journalists to think about is that access isn't actually that difficult to get. There's going to be so much leaking coming out of this White House. Whenever you have a civil war within an institution, uh, that, that is a bonanza for journalists because everybody wants to talk. On the flip side, we've seen in Donald Trump an overt willingness to blacklist 
reporters and media organizations uh, whose coverage that he wasn't terribly happy with. Some journalists have a fear that if they don't have access, they can't do their job as well. But then you have to say to yourself, what do you do with access um, You know, in, in, a, in a state that doesn't want you to tell the truth? What does it mean to have access? And I think that if reporters have access, it will be to do the sort of puff pieces that we've already seen um, in People and in 60 Minutes, the ones that are trying to assure Americans that everything is normal. The normalization narrative has crept in despite unprecedented criticism of an American president-elect, much of which is still coming from within Republican ranks. And the hope, they said in the 1960s, Glenn Beck, a former Fox News anchor, used to be the toast of the Tea Party and the far right of the GOP. Even Beck is saying that Trump's choice of Steve Bannon as his chief strategist is beyond the pale. If you know Steve Bannon's agenda and his vision of America, it's not pretty. Bannon ran Breitbart News, a platform that's popular with the Republican base, described as alt-right by some, far-right by others. And you don't have to dig deep into the site's archives to find headlines like these on racial and gender issues. Bannon understands the media game and the new media game probably better than anyone else alive. That's where Bannon's value is gonna be. Bannon is a general, he's like the general patent of media. You want him talking strategy. Breitbart is a power player on the right. There's no, there's no question about it. And the idea that their chairman is now a chief strategist at the White House tells you just how rapidly the media outlet has risen in power. However, we are in completely uncharted territory. There is a, a white nationalist, a white supremacist who is running strategy for the United States administration. Ryan Grimm runs the DC Bureau for the left of center Huffington Post, while Mike Cernovich, a self-described American nationalist, is hugely popular among Trump supporters and the alt-right for his political views and media critiques that he posts on the web. I got the suspicion based on pictures I had seen of various crowds that the media wasn't telling the full story. Steve Bannon, Steve Bannon led the... the uh, yeah. And their differing views of Steve Bannon, one's white supremacist being the other's General Patton, typify the increasingly polarized U.S. political landscape and the two media echo chambers, where too many Americans go, mostly online, to have their views reinforced rather than challenged. We are so divided now. People don't talk to each other and that includes Democrats and Republicans. Most of what we read isn't really journalism, it's editorializing. A 24, 25-year-old blogger at the Huffington Post or the Washington Post, the blogger at the New York Times, they think they know everything about the world, so they don't talk to anybody. They just editorialize about the way the world is, according to them, and the way they believe the world should be. What journalists should do now is grit their teeth, do actual journalism, and they should leave their echo chambers and talk to the Americans who voted for Trump. We have never had a political situation in the U.S. like this, mainly because of the splintering of the media. Even four years ago, eight years ago, when Barack Obama was running, the social media aspect of things had nothing like the power it does now. There are many, many people on both sides who don't actually access or engage with media that is representative of the other point of view. And that is why I'm talking to you right now and why I talk to people who maybe don't agree with me and who maybe actually want to make me look bad or cover me critically because as long as we're talking to each other, then we're not being violent towards one another. Has anybody, has anyone in the leadership ever Before said I get that? It, you're either going to stop talking or I'm going to cut your mic off. want to be very clear on this. Cut his damn mic. We need to have uncomfortable conversations. That includes the media. He's going okay, to come let's back stop. for you. Everybody, cut the mic.